Welcome to Commander Central episode 241, and it's time for another Dex You Play episode. And this week we're li- looking at listener and Patreon supporter Trent Trombley's Ho Tuo Honored Physician deck. I'm Max. I'm Dana. And I'm Nick. And I butchered that card name, everybody. <laughs> You but, could you could hear it in my voice as I said I'm Dana. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but more importantly, Nick, welcome to the show. Hey everyone, thanks for having me. Nick, why don't you let our audience know where they might know you from? Yeah, so you've probably uh maybe seen me around Twitter. I've got like two hundred followers. I'm a pretty big deal. <laughs> I'm one half of the scrap trawlers. We primarily make budget EDH content. Uh we do streams on twitch on every other sunday and we also do discussion streams uh, every other tuesday we most recently did one on one one counters on a budget a lot of those cards actually came from uh zendikar rising and commander legends so that was fun and uh we've had uh, both of you on the scrap trawlers for one of our latest episodes too yeah totally we had a blast on that stream and i love tuning into you guys every big battle stream and your discussion streams uh i'm learning a lot from you guys and i i really enjoy your your stream and it's getting more popularity every week when i jump into chat i think and i think we're gonna actually come back on for for a chance to replay those decks at some point in a couple weeks yeah that's right and and that was a really good experience actually because building on a budget you're forced to omit certain cards that you might just have lying around it really makes you dig deeper to like try to find interesting ways to to do things that you or ordinarily would, would otherwise kind of take a shortcut and just play that you know sex in the library or whatever it would be and you, know, you can't afford that clearly in a 50 dollar deck so you have to like find ways to get that card advantage without relying on those those fantastic staples it's just a really i think really good exercise even if you are aren't someone who's stuck building on a budget, I, I would highly recommend that as a kind of a um, experiment or a kind of a, a deck building challenge for everyone to do because it absolutely, I think, makes you a better deck builder when, it, when you have to dig deep and like come up with like ingenious ways to to work around the, the limitations. So thank you very much, Nick, for giving us a chance to do that. And I want to say I appreciate it. It, it did help me out. Um, not only was it fun, I think it was a good learning experience. Definitely. And uh, thanks, for, thanks for both of you showing up too. Couldn't have done it without you, literally. <laughs> so the reason we brought Nick on today is because I remember a while back, I saw you were actually building this commander or actually still have it in your stable. Is that true, Nick? Yes, it is. Um, I've had this deck, I I built it right during the beginning of the quarantine, so around April of last year, and uh, I just really enjoyed it. So before we move on to the deck tech, uh, have either of you gotten to play some games this week? I didn't get to play any. Um, Usually I I, I do some streaming on Wednesday night and get to play, but that was the day that, you know, we had an insurrection, so we decided it didn't. No one was really in the headspace to play Commander on Wednesday night after an attempted coup, so I didn't get a chance to play last week. How about either of you two? I have not played in about a week at this point now, so I'm hopefully to get to rectify that in the upcoming weekend here. Yeah, I also have not played any <laughs> uh, any games last week. As you said, a lot was a uh, lot was going on in the U.S., and uh, I just kind of wanted to take a break. I'm on vacation this whole week, so maybe I can you know put out the bat single and get a couple games going. One thing I, I will quick comment on here, just because this seems like an interesting time to mention it, is something I've noticed, and I want to see if you guys ran into this too. You know, I'm still playing Commander this year uh, on webcam, but I, I'm probably not playing as many games as I was playing last year, you know, because I'll play two games on stream or whatever. But when I would go to my shop on Commander Night, I would oftentimes like play four or five games because I was just there for that long. So while it's easier to play maybe on webcam at home, I've just found myself playing a few less games. In addition, to that because it's the year of commander last year and they're just in general printing way more commander cards and i think also i've added a couple more more decks to my roster so i'm playing less we've got a bunch more cards and the the less games i'm playing are spread up spread among a few more decks not a ton more but like a couple more i've found myself really running into points where i go to add new cards from like a new expansion and realize i haven't seen the cards i put in my deck from like the previous two expansions yet i just haven't happened to draw into them because i'm i'm, I'm playing less playing the decks less there's so many new cards being added is that something you guys have run into or, or noticed like a ramp up in that this year or is that just me yeah so kind of running into that now i know uh dana you had mentioned earlier in one of the podcasts you had some trouble keeping up with the names of all the new legendary creatures for my core yeah. where yeah. 
I'm I'm kind of at that point, not so much as you know forgetting what's what's new and you know the names of everything. I don't even pay attention to the names anymore, if I'm being honest. <laughs> but I just I'm just now getting to Corset Twenty One. I think what came out last year, as far as adding new cards to decks. So I'm way far behind. It, it was a thing I also ran into. I remember once upon a time years ago when I first started playing, when there was only like fourteen planeswalkers or, or sixteen planeswalkers, whatever it was, Return to Ravnica style. So at that point, you know, there's three Jaces. There's the original Jace Belrin. There's Jace the Mind Sculptor, and there was Architect of Thought that came out in Return to Ravnica. So I could know roughly what all three Jaces did and what their abilities were. Like I just, you know, I, I knew what the one was the kind of the mini factor fiction and there was those kind of things on the Jace. I knew roughly what the three Chandras did. I knew, you know, th- there was one a Johnny or two a Johnny's or something like I knew more or less what every Planeswalker did. I, I have no clue today. I couldn't tell you what the 17 different Jaces do that all have very similar names and similar abilities. So th- that's something the Planeswalker thing has, has really kind of blended that all together. And now I'm just, yeah, I'm seeing that with creatures now too, where there's just so many legends that I can't remember which mutate commander is which, or it's it's gotten to be at least too much for my brain. Have you read into any of this kind of stuff at all, Max? You know, I, I don't update my decks as vigilantly as you do, Dana. Okay. So <laughs> I definitely have gotten to see some of like the Commander Legends stuff that I've put into my decks. I, I mean, I don't pay attention kind of to begin with with all the card <laughs> names unless I think it's going to show up a lot or I want to play it personally. Like there's plenty of times in VEDH games where I just say, hey, what, what was that card again? What does that do? Oh, this was just printed two weeks ago. You know, oh, I have no idea. Sure. But, you know, I... I definitely think I'm playing more than I was last year Okay. when the pandemic just started. Because, I mean, compared to, like, going to our LGS, I would only go for a couple games and then leave. Sure. And now, instead of feeling locked down to always playing on Tuesdays, you know, I might play t- on a Tuesday. I might play on a Thursday. I might play two or three games on a Saturday because it is so, so much easier just to pop into a Slack or a Discord and just be like, hey, looking for a game. And then you probably have one within 10 minutes. So. Sure. That's a, I think that's I'm a good playing point. equally as much, if not more, just not on a dedicated night anymore, which I actually like a lot. So for anyone out there that wants to get in contact with us and tell us about the games you've played, how would they do that, Dana? You can find us on the Twitter birds at CMDR Central. You can find us on Facebook doing a search for CMDR Central and online at CMDRCentral.com. You can also head over to patreon.com slash CMDR Central and check out our reward tiers, such as a Dex You Play episode, or otherwise just a few bucks to jump into our Slack and chat with us and play games with all of our other listeners. We just want to say thank you to everybody who supports us through Patreon or even just hitting that thumbs up on YouTube or downloading us on your favorite podcasting platform on your mobile devices. Yeah, we've had a, a, all our patron supporters that are in our Slack have been very vigorously debating the new Kaldheim cards that came out. So that's been really, it, it's always good to see other opinions on cards that are coming out other than just your own. And I think that's been a really useful thing every time there's a new expansion, which is, you know, every four weeks, <laughs> more or less, to see everyone actually talking about the cards and getting a bunch of different points of view on things that come out. So uh, that's one of the features we offer. That's been fantastic. And thank you everyone who participates in that and everyone in general who supports us, even if it's just by listening and engaging on your social media platform of choice or, or upvoting us, however you listen, it means a lot and we want to thank you. Well, how about we get into this deck list, guys? Let's do it. Yeah, let's go. Okay. So like I said earlier, this, I can't pronounce it. Uh, how to is that right? Nope. I, I believe it's Hua Tuo, but I might be mistaken. Hua Tuo. So from now on, I'm just going to call him HT because that's <laughs> way easier for me. This deck was submitted by Trent Trombley, one of our listeners, Patreon supporters, and fellow EDH rec writer, Dana. Yes, indeed. And as always, we always ask a bunch of questions so we kind of know where we need to aim the deck tech at. So uh, I'll kick it off. We always ask, what is their meta like? And Trent says his main play group is a group of close friends and significant others, roughly eight people, who he's played with for roughly five or so years. And it's all been done over virtual EDH since they all live on different parts of the country. He's curated a pretty close group and have a great variety of decks from gumball decks to full themed like uh, Cemetery Tribal to more optimized decks. This deck is probably one of my two most tuned decks and off- faces off against the more storm or proliferate decks uh, in the pod. But overall, they're mostly a pretty casual group. They don't emphasize infinite combos or linear win cons, but they come up from time to time. Based on his playgroup stats, around 50%... 56% of our games end through combat damage. That's my type of EDH game right there. 
<laughs> with the rest of the games ending through some type of ETB or LTB triggers or damage and drain effects. Outside of the play gr- of his immediate playgroup, he likes to play against the Commander Central people or the EDH Rex staff. So the goal in the deck, Trent says, it's a mix of the classic Stompy Timmy deck with as much of a top deck matters theme uh, that he could splash. We characterize it as a toolbox deck using many search effects or top deck manipulation to ramp and interact with opponents' threats, all while simultaneously developing a board state to swing in. It looks like uh, he's attempted to convert this to a Hans Ericsson deck, new Gruul commander from uh, Commander Legends, I believe, but because of the uh, the history he has with uh, Huatuo, he's going to stick with it. So the main goal of the deck, and this is funny because this is how I built mine as well, uh, it's to use Deceiver of Exarch, which is a weird Eldrazi card. Uh, I can actually read that here. So Deceiver uh, of Form, it's 6 and a colorless for an 88 Eldrazi. At the beginning of combat on your turn, you reveal the top card of your library. If a creature card is revealed this way, you may have creatures you control other than Deceiver of Form become copies of that card until end of turn, and you can either keep that card on top or put it on the bottom. So the goal <laughs> the goal for that is to uh, make some weird top deck plays. Uh, sometimes this means activating Huatuo to put a big creature on top before moving to combat. Uh, other times it might be using a search effect to use Pathbreaker Ibex or Elder Gargaroth on top to make a small board into like a huge threat or you can draw a million creatures or gain some life. Uh, so yeah, that's that's pretty fun. It looks like there's technically a tree of arbitrary and infinite combos, all centered around um, Huotuo All-Star, Verdant Succession. Uh, but I've only, he's only managed to pull it off once or twice. I actually don't have Verdant Succession pulled up. Uh, do either of you? Verdant Succession is an enchantment for four and a green. Whenever a green non-token creature dies, that creature's controller may search their library for a card with the same name as that creature and put it onto the battlefield. And if that player does, they shuffle their library. So I, I believe the trick there is a little bit of stack manipulation. A creature dies and... Oh no, how does that work? Um, so how that works is, well, let's say you have Sakura Tribe Elder and Huotuo and Verdant Succession on the field. You can sacrifice Steve, and with the Verdant Succession trigger on the stack, you can actually use Huotuo to put it on top of your library to then search it go. out again and put it right back into play. I knew there was some little bit of uh, chicanery there that let you manipulate that. So there we go. Uh, uh, explained by the player who actually plays the uh, deck. <laughs> the best way to go. <laughs> so uh, fun things you can do with Succession, Trent says, with either God Eternal Ronus, Vigor, or World Spine Worm, plus Succession, plus a Sacrifice Outlet, you can stack the triggers from the creatures to resolve it before the Succession trigger, which is, you know, does what I just said, uh, puts it right back into play from the library. With Ronus, you can pump the team to uh, infinite numbers. With World Spine Worm, you can make a bunch of three, you can make three, six, six, or what is it? No, five, five worms every time it dies. So you can just make as much of those as you want. Uh, If the sack outlet is greater good, you can draw your whole deck. If it's Altar of Dementia, you can just mill out the entire table. And if it's Perilous Fouriers, you can just search for, you know, all the basics in your deck. So lots of fun stuff you can do with that, uh, with that, you know, weird niche interaction. Good news with this one, uh, Trent's not primarily a combo player. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but there's no way to, uh, there's currently no way to tutor for the enchantment or the sack outlets. It's all just creature tutors. So it's in there mainly because uh, he can respond to creature death uh, with Huo Tuo and get it back into play. I am not a combo player either, but I will say this. You probably, uh, even if you dislike combos, you probably shouldn't be getting too salty about like a three or four card combo where half the pieces are not tutorable. Like the odds of that, you know, successfully being pulled off is pretty slim. And um, as far as combos go, I feel like that one shouldn't generate too many feel bads. It's a pretty weird interaction. And if someone stumbles across it, the game game is probably at a point where it needed to be, you know, put to bed anyway. We always ask, what are the areas of weakness or areas we should focus on? And Trent says, the biggest challenge has been balancing enough top deck matters cards with payoffs, namely creatures. He realizes at one point he had too much top deck synergy, but not enough creatures. So keeping the creature count to around 33 has seemed to be the sweet spot. Cards like Track Down, Path of Discovery, and See the Unwritten are all awesome, but he worries that uh, too much spice ruins the soup, so to speak, and they'll start to detract from the actual payoffs in the deck. He would like some advice in evaluating cards like that, though, while keeping the creature count still pretty high. As it stands right now, he doesn't have any idea what cards he would cut if he were to try to squeeze some more of those things in. 
Notably, everything in the maybe board are cards he has tried. So there's a list of, of cards here on the deck list. And we'll put that out there in the uh, link when we when we tweet this out when that show goes live. Because he's more than happy to hear recommendations on them again. Many cards consistently have come in and out. But as for now, he's treating it like a log of cards that he has play tested. He says he's not looking to optimize too much more. If anything, he'd rather swap cards laterally than vertically as it sits in kind of a perfect power nook right now. So he took out Crater with Behemoth because it became too too linear and he doesn't want to look to upgrade too many of these cards to something like a Crater Hoof that he's already taken out. Awesome. Finally, we always ask what the budget restrictions are for the upgrades, and Trent says preferably nothing more than $100 for the individual card. Gaia's Cradle can get a giant F you to it. <laughs> <laughs> Some cards he has been keeping an eye on are, of course, Scroll Rack with its recent reprinting in Commander Legends, but he has no personal experience and would love hear to hear our take on it if we've played with it. Same goes for Miri's Guile. He's eyed for a long time, just hasn't had a chance to play yet. I have a couple questions for Nick here briefly, but I think beforehand, since since that just popped up, do either of you two have any thoughts on Scroll Rack or Mary's Guile in this style of deck? For Scroll Rack, it's a card that I've been wanting and, you know, I wasn't going to spend that much money on it until it got its recent reprint. I've been checking my LGS every single week. <laughs> to see if they have one that's, you know, worth picking up for like 30 bucks. So far, no luck yet. I tend to spend all of my um, money for big ticket cards at my LGS just to support them a little bit. But looking forward to giving that in the deck eventually. You don't need it to, you know, to make the deck go, but it just enables you to do some things that you just otherwise couldn't. Uh, you don't have, you don't really have like a real brainstorm in green, except for like, you know, Miri's Guile. So that's just kind of a nice thing to do if you need to manipulate, you know, the top card of your deck from your hand. And for those that don't know Miri's Guile, it's a one mana green enchantment. During your upkeep, you may look at the top three cards of your library and put them back in any order. I obviously have not played this deck, speaking from experience in other decks at least, and, and I don't know how much that translates here. Scroll Rack is a really good card, but I generally think you want to have some amount of shuffle effects or you find yourself kind of locked where like you're at three cards in hand and you draw three and put three back. And even if one of them is a creature that you're going to do something off the top deck with, you still can sometimes like if, if there's nothing in there that you can use, you're still kind of locked. So it gives, it's, got, it's kind of a one-off effect. The deck that works best for me, and I've had the best experience with it, is in my uh, Sphinx Tribal deck. Number one, there's a quite a few different shuffle effects in there but number two the deck tends to draw a bunch of cards so fairly frequently i'll have like 11 or 12 cards in my hand or something and being able to to, to dig down that far almost makes it like a tutor effect it's like i'm trying to find that last win condition i've got four sphinxes on board and i just need to find a true conviction to kill people or something that's how it works really well for me i don't know if this deck ever has that many cards in hand either necessarily. And Miri's Guile is like one of those cards where once upon a time it was a budget version of of uh, Sylvan Library and then they kind of switched places after a reprint where Miri's Guile was more expensive and I think they've now kind of inverted again because Sylvan Library is once again expensive. They don't stack which is kind of a problem there. You know you're, you're kind of doing the same thing. You can looking at the top three cards if you have Miri's Guile doesn't do you much good if you have a, if you have a Sylvan Library out already. So I, I don't know if that's, it's nice to have double effects, but I feel like if you want one more of these, I might have even said Divining Top instead, because it does give you the option to draw a card out of the way. Let's say you, you know, have a couple creatures on top and you're going to do something with them. Then there's, a, then there's a land there. At least you can maybe draw that land out of the way and put, put top back on top and then do something with it. I don't know, but I don't love Miri's Guile. Do you guys have any thoughts on that card? I think it doesn't quite do enough. And what it does is kind of replicated elsewhere so that you don't want too many of those things. Yeah, I I, I, would, I tend to agree with you there, Dana. If Trent's already running like so in library and I right. think there's a top in the list. So I think that's just too much redundancy because the cards are practically doing the yeah. same exact thing. I, I think if we had to, if I had to personally pick between the scroll rack or Mary's Guile, I'd go scroll rack just because you can do one card, you can do three cards, you can do 20 cards just based on what's in your hand. You know, the flexibility right there is, is huge versus seeing the same three cards over and over between Miri's Guile and Sylvan Library. So Nick, before we get started here, since you have played this deck, I'm going to ask you a few things about yours. How long have you been playing this deck? How long did you, have you had a, like, a Huatuo deck? Since, uh, I said at the beginning of the show, but it was April of last year, right in the, like right at the beginning of quarantine for the pandemic. So that's when you put it, so, you, so you've been playing it about a year. What? Why did this particular commander appeal to you? <laughs> well, um, oddly enough, 
stuff. So Trent mentioned that you know Deceiver form was the main one of the main drives of building the deck. Same thing for me. I love I love the card. It's just it just does something in you know in Magic that almost no other card does at least in the way it does it requires a lot of setup so when you do pull it off it's you know it's really exciting and so that's that's kind of like the master game plan with yours as well as to get to that deceiver reforms play what's what's kind of a win like how does your deck put away a game how does it win so there are a couple ways you can do it with Deceiver Reform. My my favorite reveal off of it is um, Thunderfoot Bailoth, which uh, it has yes. that lieutenant ability. So if you reveal it with Uotuo out in the field, everything gives everything else plus two plus two. So you essentially have like on the right board, you know, five or ten of these things just to make your board huge and you can just <laughs> swing for the win. Nice. So you're, you're basically using that ability to put things in the top to then set yourself up to turn that into probably a combat damage win, I'm assuming. Right, that's the uh, that's the main way the uh, the deck wins, in my opinion. Uh, so there, there are two ways that I have built this deck, and if there's another way to build it, you know, I'm sure somebody will, will let us know. You know, one is the way that Trent and I are building it, which is, um, you know, do everything from the top using tutors and um you know everything else to just stack the top of your of your deck without the use of the graveyard the other way is to use you know golgari grave troll effects where you just you know kind of flip your deck upside down and then you can from there you know do your toolbox things for oh i need to draw this this acidic slime for term i'll just put it on top of my deck before my draw step so i can get it yeah that's the um it's it's the biggest dredger, right? It's got dredge six or something. Correct. Yeah, I, I, th- I think we have we uh, have a friend in common who would be also be a fan of that card. S- somebody, <laughs> I, I, I think I know their name. I, I was going to say, I'm, I'm shocked you don't know that for fact. <laughs> as, soon, as soon as I heard Go- Grave Troll, I was just like, oh, okay, I get, I get it. I see where that's coming from. But yeah, other than um, other than doing the um, you know the, the stompy thing, uh, my deck has a backup in Shaman of Forgotten Ways. Just you know, in case you can't get through with damage, you can just kind of kind of cheese them out by putting their life total really low. I'm just trying to figure out another win that way. Okay, so we should probably read Huo Tuo first here. It's one green green for a one two legendary creature human. You can tap to put target card from your graveyard on top of your library. Activate this only during your turn and before attackers are declared. So, like usual, we start off with the land slot. Dana, you want to go through what we have for lands today? Certainly can. There's 37 lands in this deck. We have an Ancient Tomb. We have a Balaged Sanctuary, which flips into the Balaged Recovery, which is the uh, regrowth. So it can be a land or the sorcery, depending on how he wants to cast it. There's a Dried Arbor, Ghost Quarter, one of two land removal lands here. I mark it as a sack outlet to let you put stuff into the graveyard if you're in a position to then tap your commander and put it back on top. A Nick though Shrine to Nyx, which is probably going to make a ton of mana in a mono green deck. Reliquary Tower, just to keep all the cards that you may draw. Scavenger Grounds, to deal with those uh, filthy, filthy graveyard players. <laughs> a, a Scrying Sheets, which is an old card that taps for colorless. It is also a snow land, and you can spend one and a snow mana to look at the top card of your library, and if that card is snow, you can reveal it and put it into your hand. There's 25 snow-covered forests, which means you almost have a 1 in 4 chance of being able to draw one of those basic lands off Scrying Sheets when you activate it. Uh, Tectonic Edge, another land removal land, along with Ghost Quarter. There's a Turn Timber, uh, the Serpentine Wood, which is one of the uh, mythic lands from Battle for Zendikar that flips over into Turn Timber Symbiosis, where you can look at the top 7 cards of your library and put a creature card from among them onto the battlefield. And last but not least, there is War Room, which is uh, 3 mana and pay life equal to the number of colors in your commander's mana card cost to draw a card so in this case three and tap to uh, pay one life and draw a card since this is a mono green deck awesome so what do we all think of this land base and do we have any suggestions for trent nick i'll hand it off to you okay well i was looking at at the list and i saw two cards that i wanted to shout out scrying sheets so at first i was like you know You know, I I see the whole scrying sheets thing here where you can just get rid of excess lands off the top of your deck. Um, You can also get the um, Orin Frostfang, that um, that new or new-ish commander card that's 
kind of like what is it reconnaissance mission where every time one of your creatures deals combat damage to a player you draw a card you can actually grab yeah. it off of that which is kind of neat i don't like it in mono green decks because you don't really need it you're getting all the lands that you need and then i remembered what set we're getting in a couple weeks so <laughs> maybe hold off on I, I was gonna hold off on even saying like get rid of it just because we might see some super sweet green creatures here you know that are snow that you can just kind of grab and manipulate so hopefully we see some cool stuff coming out there the other card i wanted to shout out was dryad arbor so Dryad Arbor is, you know, it's normally like a risky inclusion. You can tutor it with, you know, any of your green stuff. Um, you can grab it with Oracle of Moldiah or Corsair of Crufix if, uh, you know, as a land. But one of the fun things here, which I'll mention once we get to the enchantment section, is there, there's a sweet little thing you can do with, with Hua Tuo and Dryad Arbor. So get to that in a second. Uh, what, what do you guys think about the land base? I was going to ask about Dryad Arbor because I traditionally see it in a deck that's kind of doing fast ramp things where it wants to maybe get lucky and have a Green Sun Zenith in hand so you can, you know, drop a forest and then Green Sun Zenith for zero and ramp that out on, on turn one. But this deck doesn't seem like that kind of an aggro deck and there's no Green Sun Zenith. So I assume there must be some some Huatuo trick here with Dried Arbor, so I am glad to see that's actually what it was, and I'm curious to find out what that trick might wind up being here. Other than that, I think it's a pretty good land base. You know, mono green, you've got a lot of room to run utility lands if you want to, but you also need to have plenty of pips to get your stuff done. So if there was something that jumped out at somebody else, there, there's probably room for it here in this deck. One of the things in my mono green deck that I kind of encounter is I do have quite a few mana doubling effects in my deck. You know, I have a, a Vernal Bloom and a, a Mana Reflection and an Extra Planar Lens, uh, Nessa Who Shakes the World, that kind of thing. All of which care about Forest for the most part. So I try to keep my Forest count at like 27-ish or so because I... If I have a double rod, I want to take as much advantage as that as possible. He's not really doing that here, so there's a little bit more room to breathe if he wants to in terms of running utility lands. And that's what he's doing. He's he's down to 25 forests, which is more than enough. But that, like Nick kind of pointed out, does make scrying sheets a little less reliable. But like Nick also pointed out, we're getting a bunch of snow stuff in, in Kaldheim. So who knows what things from that might wind up being useful in this deck and we'll kind of balance it out as well. So I think it's a pretty good land base. The only thing I would say is like down the road, I, like, I, I wouldn't ever go spend $25 on a strip mine. But at some point, it's going to wind up getting reprinted in some set. And if it's available to you or you find one, you know, in a collection you buy or, or something along those lines, Strip Mine is by far the best land removal land. But it's also not the kind of thing I think is worth spending $25 versus 25 cents for a Tectonic Edge. So I'll make that note, but I don't think anyone should actually ever make that upgrade. I don't think it's worth the money for the most part. So I'm, I'll make a notation of that, but I don't think it's worth the investment. How about you, Max? Any thoughts here? You know, I initially was going to say this is a good land base, but then during the, the scroll rack discussion, you mentioned shuffling Dana. Mm -hmm. and how this deck might benefit from more shuffling than the average EDH deck. So my first thought was maybe swap that Ghost Quarter out for a Field of Ruin. Sure. You still kill a land and you get to shuffle your deck, you know, so that's always good. And it's monocolored, so running stuff like your what are the crappy search ones that everybody plays in standard because <laughs> they're free expanse and evolving wilds yeah those you could run those <laughs> in this deck just to help shuffle the deck if you don't have something on the top of your library you want to be using right away or even like ash baron so that lets you cycle and go get the land it would, would be a similar option you know and, and it's a little bit slower but myriad landscape will give you a a, a shuffle effect to go get two lands uh, on, a, on a land as well and it's you know it's it's effectively ramp so that could be an option as well all righty uh any other comments on the land section guys yeah i do have uh two suggestions uh for you know things you things you could run if you didn't like scrying sheets after you know i just talked it up i don't know how that's <laughs> gonna work uh but the first one i'd suggest is gyre reach sanitarium it's a legendary land from i think shadows over in Estrad. uh it adds a colorless yep. And you can pay two, tap it, and each player draws a card and discards a card. So one thing I forgot to mention with the land base is Deceiver of Form does require colorless mana in order for it to be used. So that's why you see, you know, quite a few colorless mana sources in the land base, which if you don't have a way to search that out and you draw Deceiver of Form, if you don't have another way to cheat it out from your hand or the top of your deck, it, it's it's a dead card, <laughs> which is unfortunate. So you actually do want a few, more than a few colorless sources. But for Guy Reach Sanitarium, draw a card, discard a card, everybody does it uh, but it's not really card disadvantage for you because you can just 
you know, bring back whatever creature you pitched with a Huotuo to the top of your deck for when you need it later. The second suggestion I have is Zulfir and Void from Dominaria. Another colorless source, it's a little bit, I don't know, I, I kind of like it about the same, if not a little more, than the uh, the Theros Temples. Uh, it's got that ETB scry 1 effect, and it taps for colorless, so could easily replace any of your colorless lands, uh, and you just get a free scry, which is nice. Yeah, that makes sense in this kind of deck where, you, where you're trying to do kind of top deck manipulation sometimes. Actually, Gite Reach Sanitarium is an excellent choice. I wasn't even thinking of that because for some reason my, my brain won't wrap itself around mono green caring about graveyard. I always think of that in terms of like a you know black deck or something that's doing reanimation stuff, but that is really good here and makes perfect sense. So that's a real good call. Awesome. So let's move on from the land base to the one and only Planeswalker. Trent is running Vivian, Monster's Advocate. This is the Vivian from Ikoria. It's three green green for a three loyalty planeswalker. Its static ability is you may look at the top card of your library at any time, and you may cast creatures spells from the top of your library. So that's fun. Way to clear out the top of your library or set up that Deceiver of Deceiver of Form. It also has a plus one ability of create a 3-3 three, three green beast creature token and then put your choice of a Vigilance counter, Reach counter, or a Trample counter on it. And it's minus two ability is when you cast your next creature spell this turn, search your library for a creature card with lower converted mana cost and put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. What does everybody think about Vivian in this top deck matters mono green deck? Having a planeswalker that gives you access to looking at the top of your library at any point in time seems pretty useful. And you can also cast things from there, functionally making it like a future site kind of just for creatures in your deck. You know, the plus one's pretty useful. And if you happen to get to a, a point where the plus two is useful, that's, I mean, like all these abilities are pretty good in this, these colors. Um, it feels like, I don't know, I'm not, is, is it good enough though? Probably, I guess I, I was going to say maybe not, but I, I it feels like it probably is, particularly when you're looking at 31 creatures in a deck, you're probably going to be pretty frequently encountering one on the top of your library. So I think it's, I think it's probably a good enough choice here. Yeah, I do. Uh, I do love this Vivian. I, I do run this in uh, in my version of the deck. If you're really, you know, going hard on that Deceiver of Form plan, it does a couple things that you want it, that you want to be doing anyway. Uh, it makes tokens, so you can turn any of those tokens into whatever you reveal off the top. You can, you know, as you said, Dana, just look at the top to see what you got. It's got the the green future sight thing where you can just, you know, play creatures off the top of your deck. So you can just start blind casting if you want. And the last thing it has is if you need a shuffle effect, like Max was saying with the uh, Terramorphic Expanses and whatnot, you can just cast any low cost creature. You can actually grab Dryad Arbor if you want and just kind of put it into play for the for the minus two and, you know, reshuffle the top to see what else you can get. So that's also nice. Yeah, the only downside of the minus two is, unfortunately, in this current deck list, there's only, I think, two creatures in here that have a CMC that would let you go get Deceiver of Forms, which is kind of too bad. But that's probably in part because Deceiver of Forms is just so expensive. You don't want to, you know, stack this deck with too many eight drops just so you can use that minus two to go get Deceiver. So uh, I get I, that makes sense why that is. Yeah, I, I agree with both of you. This is this is a really good planeswalker for this deck. My only suggestion would be kind of what you were talking about earlier, Dana, with like Nissa who shakes the world or Nissa Vital Force, just more for the overall generic mono green value both of those planeswalkers give. But this is super cool and super unique and specific to this deck, and I, I really like that. And I don't foresee needing to cut it at all. So, how about we move over to the sorceries, Nick? What do we have in the sorcery slots today? All right, so for sorceries, we have Finale of Devastation, Into the North, uh, which is going to be really relevant once Kaldheim releases, Piers Whim, Silvala's Stampede, Sky Shroud Claim, Sylvan Scrying, Sylvan Tutor, and then we have the, uh, the, the, the Zendikar Fliplands. We have Balagad Recovery and Turn Timber Symbiosis. So there's some some top deck manipulation there, things like Sylvan Tutor puts stuff on top, so you can do some manipulation there, some ramp. Saval Stalpede is just backbreaking pretty often when you cast it. The one card that sticks out at me that I don't love is, is the one Nick mentioned is Into the North. Now that may change. In Into the North, the way it reads is search your library for a snow land card and put it into play tap, then shuffle your library. So that will go get you any of your forests. And it'll go get that scrying sheet. So so maybe that's the important part. Scrying sheets is a snow land and maybe it is it winds up being something he goes and gets a lot. So that that could be relevant. Myself, I feel like using like a nature's lore or a three visits or something to have you're stuck going to get a basic land, but like aside literally aside from scrying sheets, you know, 
into the north goes and gets 26 cards in this library and nature's lore and three physics go, go get 25 of them the one exception is scrying sheets and i feel like the land coming into play untapped off into the north or three visits is, is probably more relevant excuse me off nature's lore or three visits is probably more relevant more often than having the option to go get scrying sheets but the thing nick did point out was sometimes you do need that colorless mana to be able to cast your deceiver forms and scrying sheets does that it is a way to go fetch a land that does make that colorless mana for Deceiver. So so I guess maybe that's the relevant portion there too. I, I'm torn. I just wanted to kind of point that out that I, I still feel like you're probably going to care about the land being untapped more often than you are about getting scrying sheets. But having never played the deck, I don't know if that's true. You have any comments here, Nick, on the sorceries? Yeah, uh, so looking at my own list, uh, I'm actually running one sorcery in the deck, and that's the uh, <laughs> Balagad Recovery. My 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 thought process when when building this deck is that kind of like how a certain one of uh, your other co-hosts uh, Dana likes using creatures for everything. You know, use a don't use a insert sorcerer for you know what a creature can do. And uh, sure, with a lot of how greens like you know all star cards work, like the Great Henge and Guardian Project, you do want as many creatures as you can get for you know some of these basic effects. Looking at you were looking into the north, which I actually like a little bit more than Sylvan Scrying here. Sylvan Scrying does get any land that you want but it doesn't ramp you it just puts it in your hand right so it does get the colorless source if i were to say you know you should get rid of one of these things sylvan scrying caught my eye you could replace that with you know diligent farm hand or yavamaya elder or yavamaya ranger i believe the one that has the uh, the echo cost on the upkeep but yeah i mean it, it's a good card i can see why it's here uh to, you know to grab those colorless sources but since you run so many already i don't think it's necessary the one thing I would say about Sylvan Scrying, because I thought the same thing. I, I tend to think Sylvan Scrying is a little bit overplayed. However, Nykthos is an absolute beating in this deck. I would bet pretty often it's probably going to be the kind of thing that taps for, you know, 8 or 10 mana very, very easily without even trying to. If not, oftentimes probably way more than that. And it will go get you your, your Nykthos. But there are green creatures that, granted, they don't cost, you know, just 2 mana, but there are green creatures that let you just go tutor a land straight up to... And I, I, I also wonder if the deck might be not be better off running a few of those those creatures that do it that you can then you know reuse if you need to with your commander. How about you, Max? Anything jump out of you? You know, you I I kind of see Dana's point on into the north. You know, it it gets scrying sheets. You know, that's the the one thing that puts it over the edge. I've ran Sylvan Scrying in the past to go grab my utility lands, to go grab a Nykthos, to go grab a Hall of the Bandit Lord. It could go grab Scrying Sheets in this deck. Sure. So I like them both. And the, the fact that this wants to be more of a casual yet optimized deck, I think swapping either of them out for something, say, like Hour of Promise, which is five mana to go get any two lands and put them into play, might be a bad move. That's just kind of a pet card of mine, so I always like telling people to play it. <laughs> but otherwise, I, I really like this. I mean, you have your tutors. I, I understand so well the Stampede can wreck house, but I've had it bite me in the butt too many times to run it myself just because I always get in the situations where people see I have one card in hand, so they just choose hand for all the modes, and then I end up not playing anything. <laughs> So how about the, the enchantments here? I can I can go down this list. We have Call of the Wild to start with, which I'm going to read here because it doesn't see a ton of play, but it's probably very good in the stack. Two green green, and then you can spend two green green and reveal the top card of your library to all players. And if that card is a creature card, put it directly into play. Otherwise, uh, put it into your graveyard. And that's not a tap ability or anything. That's, that's an ability that can be used as long as you have the mana to use it. You can Put the, the cards from the top of your library directly into play. Cream the Crop, another little bit more obscure card from the Lorwyn block. Enchantment for one and a green. Whenever a creature comes into play under your control, you may look at the top X cards of your library where X is that creature's power. And if you do, put one of those cards in the top of your library and the rest on the bottom of your library. So if you play a creature card, you can basically set up, hopefully, the uh, top of your library with something that's very beneficial to you. If not, that Deceiver reforms. Uh, Evolutionary Leap is a sack outlet, uh, same with Greater Good that's next. Guardian Project, disgustingly powerful card from uh, a year or two back that whenever a non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control, if it doesn't have the same name as another creature you control or a creature card in your graveyard, draw a card. So in this particular deck, that's almost always just going to draw you a card when a creature comes into play. Kenrith's Transformation, and then lower on down the list, Song of the Dryads, to auras that uh, turn a creature in Kenrith's Transformation's case or a 
not only permanent in the case of Song of the Dryads, just into a, uh, a useless, colorless forest land. Uh, Lurking Predators, uh, enchantment for four green green. Whenever a opponent casts a spell, reveal the top card of your library. And if it's a creature card, put it on the battlefield. Otherwise, you may put that card on the bottom of your library. Uh, you may put it on the bottom of your library. You don't have to. So you're just going to put free creatures into play at the top of your library, something that you can use a Watchwell's ability to set up for yourself. And even if you don't, in a deck that's this creature thick, the odds are pretty decent that, you know, if every single person on the board plays a creature, you're going to get one free thing off it. A uh, Perilous Forways, basically another sack outlet here that lets you sack a creature and search your library for a land card with a basic land type and put it into play tapped and shuffle your library. Civil in the Library, really good draw outlet and top deck manipulation in this deck. The Verdant Succession that we talked about uh, earlier on. And the last but not least, a Vernal Bloom. Three and a green. Whenever a forest is tapped for mana, its controller adds an additional green into his or her mana pool. So that's a pretty uh, solid collection of enchantments, 12 of them here total. And I'll throw it back to you here, Max. Anything that you uh, want to talk about or would add or remove here? So I want to talk about a card that Trent talked about in his notes to us, and that's Path of Discovery. So it's a four mana, three and a green enchantment. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, it explores. So you reveal the top card of your library, put that card in your hand if it's a land, otherwise put a plus one, plus one counter on the creature, then put that card back on top or put it in your graveyard. I love this card. I've ran it in a few of my decks in the past. I definitely think he's running enough creatures to where having it in the deck isn't kind of walk crossing that line into too much top deck manipulation because it's going to do a couple things. It's going to pump whatever creature you just play if you flip a non-creature spell or a non-land card. Also, if you don't want that card on top of your library, if it's not a land, you can dump it into your graveyard to bring it back with Hua Tuo, which is just really nice synergy. So maybe you don't have enough mana to cast that card that you're probably going to draw next turn. So dump it and reanimate it when you and put it back on your li- top of your library when you're ready for it to play it or use it with Deceiver of Form. So I definitely think that's worth trying in the deck. Lurking Predators is great. I've never gotten that card to work for myself, so I'd love to hear how it works in this deck just because, again, I think the creature count is high enough. I will quick echo that Lurking Predator sentiment. It's sentiment. It's one of those cards that I've always wanted to try to make work, and I've never had a deck that's a good fit for it, but I love the card. There's a similar one, I guess I wouldn't, it's not too similar, called Wild Pair. Whenever you have a creature come into play, you can go grab another creature with equal power and toughness. Wild Pair is another one that's similar casting cost, kind of lets you kind of cheat creatures into play. I like both those cards, and I've just never quite had a deck that like worked well enough with them to make me want to run it, so I'm, I'm I was glad to see Lurking Predators pop up in a deck. Yeah. My my other suggestion, but I think this is going to take a little too much work to actually make work in the deck, is Descendant's Path. This is an enchantment from Avacyn Restored. At the beginning of your upkeep, reveal the top card of your library. You may cast it without paying its mana cost if it's a creature spell that shares a creature type with a creature you control. Otherwise, you put it on the bottom of your library. When I was doing the prep for this show, there aren't enough, like, duplicates. Like, there are a couple elves. There's a couple elks. There's a couple humans, but I don't think there's enough enough, you know, to make sure it hits every time or a good portion of the time when you trigger a Descendant's Path. That's always kind of been my experience with Descendant's Path as well. It's just not quite consistent enough. I mean, I can see why that would be the case here, but it's also one of those things like Working Predators. I've always always wanted to make work in a deck, so um, I get that completely. How about you, Nick? Any, any thoughts on the enchantment suite here? Yeah, so I run all of these except for Song of the Dryads, which I have in another deck. And uh, another one I want to talk about, Kenrit's Transformation. So I, I, I kind of forgot this card existed. Uh, <laughs> it's it's a really sweet budget option. You know, green's main way of getting rid of creatures is, you know, the, the fight effect. But sometimes creatures are indestructible and you know, they have some other way where you just can't really get rid of them. And uh, this is a nice way to get an answer for that. You It also cantrips, which is really nice. So I do like that here. I can say with confidence, Lurking Predators is a house in this deck. <laughs> Especially with um, all of the, you know, Sylvan Tutors and all the other tutors and Huo Tuo, you can just kind of... It's really funny because it almost has that rattlesnake effect where nobody really wants to cast anything if you put something on top. Like, if you put Acidic Slime on top of the deck, no one's really going to want to... <laughs> play like an, a you know a nice artifact or enchantment you can't hit it with the acidic slime since it'll come down first but still the the threat is there and it's it's really fun 
Then when it comes back around to you and you, it's time for you to draw that acidic slime, you just use yourself in the library to make sure it stays on top of the library and you're, you're good to go. It's just always there as a threat for everybody. Right, exactly. I do have two cards I would like to see. One is Garrick's Uprising from Core 21. It might You might need to change uh, some of the creatures around in the deck. Uh, I don't think there are enough four power creatures in the deck right now. I think I counted, you know, 12 or 13, but Garrick's Uprising, it's two and a green. When it enters the battlefield, if you control a creature with power four or greater, draw a card. Creatures you control have trample, and whenever a creature with power four or greater ETBs under your control, you draw a card. So just a, a nice extra layer of trample and evasion for the deck. Uh, there's a couple right now that I can see, you know, with the P Pathbreaker, Ibex, and all of that. Having extra is nice, and, you know, the passive card draw is pretty sweet, too. And the other one I want to suggest, uh, we have to go back to Dryad Arbor real quick. So Dryad Arbor is a forest. <laughs> and that's that's why I'm putting this yeah. out. So if you want to do this, and I, I would do this if I had a Dryad Arbor, I can't find one, but I would, you know, jam Lost in the Woods into this deck, <laughs> which is a really old enchantment, or old, I guess, from Dark Ascension. It's three and double green. Whenever a creature attacks you or a planeswalker you control, reveal the top card of your library. If it's a forest card, fog that creature. <laughs> then you can put that card on the bottom of your library. You know, Spore Frog and Constant Mist is, you know, are the better fog cards. But if you want to be funny, you can put Dried Arbor from your graveyard on top of your library with Hua Tuo and have Lost in the Woods <laughs> in the play. And people are going to know, kind of like the Rattlesnake effect, that, well, if I swing one creature in here, it's just going to get blanked. <laughs> so just, just a little <laughs> fun thing you can do. Good call. Um, it definitely pays to have someone with this deck who has played it with some experience on here, talking about a few of these little ins and outs. I like it. Thanks a lot. Yeah, that, that's some spicy tech. I really like it. So how about we move over to the instance, and there are four of them. We have a Beast Within, Heroic Intervention, Noxious Revival, and Worldly Tutor. H any suggestions from either of you? I mean, Beast Within is a fantastic removal spell. This is kind of a perfect deck for Noxious Revival. It lets you put a card on top of your library, so basically, you know, copies your commander ability if he's not available or if you need a second version of it. You can cast it for nothing if you have a, you know, two life you don't mind sparing. And in, in an emergency, the ability to, like, put someone's fetch land on top of their library with it because it doesn't, doesn't specify it has to be you, and it is an instant. So I've actually seen this card get used to buy one turn when someone like tries to vamp tutor a, a combo piece to the top. You can knock just revival a, a kind of junk card onto, onto their library on top of that and buy yourself a turn. That sounds really narrow, but I've absolutely seen it happen, and it's something to consider. That So... Extra Survival is just a really good card, and for all of those reasons in a lot of decks, and it's even better here where you can do things with the top of your library. So, excellent card, and glad to see that one included. There's nothing specific, though, I want to shout out. Return of the Wild Speaker is a really good draw spell, and it, it also can double as a win condition in a deck that's just this creature heavy. So that's one I might run here if I was putting the deck... Depending on how often people go after your commander and try to kill it, because I feel like it's probably an important part of the deck to a degree. You know, there, there, there's different ways in green and instant speed you can make a commander hexproof. Um, obviously, there's things like Veil of Summer, but there's much you know, there's cheaper ways to do it that either make your commander hexproof or regenerate stuff. If you need some instant speed protection, but it's, I, I don't think he does. I don't think he does. I as useful as Huatuo is in this deck, I feel like people probably aren't burning removal spells on it very often. I think it kind of sits in that sweet spot where, yeah, it's going to do cool stuff, but it's nothing at all compared to that other person's Chew Lane or something. So I don't know how much protection you need besides heroic intervention to save your whole board sometimes. So no, I think this is a pretty solid instant suite, and I think this whole deck is pretty tight. I'm, I'm really <laughs> having a tough time finding a ton of suggestions. It uh, seems pretty well put together. What do you, what do you guys think of all that? I, yeah, I agree. The only card I could maybe think of swapping in this would maybe be a lateral move versus a, an up and down power move would be shared summons. So this is the five mana tutor that lets you get two creatures with different names into your hand at instant speed. If you wanted to maybe move the power level down just a bit, you could easily swap that in for maybe the Sylvan tutor, although that does put it right on top, which plays into the strategy be behind your commander. How about you, Nick? Anything jumping on at you here? Yeah, so I'm gonna, you know, I'm going to sound like a hypocrite now. Uh, I did mention before, <laughs> you know, don't use an instant or sorcery for, um, you know, for what a creature can do. 
So I do want to add, or I do want to suggest two instants here. One is Kroos and Grip. You know, K Grip is a classic commander card, and nothing else that I can think of right now has split second, which is kind of what you want with K Grip. Otherwise, you're running, you know, Naturalize or something else or Reclamation Sage. And the reason I'm suggesting this is for the Aristocrats player in Trent's meta. So in case, you know, they have the the altar of whatever, and you need to interact <laughs> with it to, to not lose right then and there, Kroos and Grip's got your back. Uh, so that would be something you could add. The other one is um, going back to uh, Zendikar Rising, kind of a freebie in most green decks now. I've been running in almost all of my green decks that have brewed recently uh, to great effect. It's uh, Colony Ambush. It's two and a green for an instant. Target creature you control fights target creature you don't control, and you can flip it over for a tap green land. That seems like it would be good in this deck for sure. Oh, yeah. Okay, let's move over to artifacts before we end the show on the creature package. So, Nick, you want to tell us what artifacts are in the deck today? Yeah, so we are seeing Altar of Dementia, Birthing Pod, Emerald Medallion, Extra Planner Lens for those snow lands, Sensei's Divining Top, Soul Ring, and the Great Henge. So it's always nice to have a, a sack out like Altar of Dementia that doesn't limit you to, to like one sack, you know, High Market's great as a land because it kind of is free. It doesn't take up a slot in the deck, really, particularly in a mono deck where you can afford a colorless mana. And in this case, kind of need it, at least for Deceiver of Forms. Um, so Altar's always really good. There's some situations where you can mill people out with it infinitely as well. Probably tougher to do in this deck than it is decks built around that, but that's always good. Birthing Pot, again, it gives you a sack outlet that's generating value, and that's kind of what most of these sack outlets are in this deck. You know, even things that we saw under enchantments like Evolutionary Leap or Greater Good. This isn't one of those decks usually where you're trying to sack like 15 things at once to generate a win condition, basically. You're looking to sacrifice something to put it back on top of your library with your commander. So your sack outlet generating you some value is pretty important here. And in Ultra Dementia is something that does that as well because you can, it's target player. So like you can put cards in your graveyard with it so so all of these sack outlets are ones that are are generating you additional value in addition to putting that creature back on your graveyard where it can be recycled so i I like seeing those kind of things here that are like squeezing every last ounce of utility out of the cards you have the the one thing they're doing is kind of stacking what it does so to speak and, and giving you a whole lot of extra value for specific play so i like that a lot and also, um, I'm first. I'm now noticing the Great Henge's price, and that's insane. <laughs> oh wow! So I just want to mention I did the that. Same thing, yeah. <laughs> I haven't looked at that in a, in a couple months, and okay. What about you, Nick? Do you have any comments or suggestions for this? Yeah. So, looking on, I don't know, <laughs> Extra Planner Lens. Maybe Extra Planner Lens is a great card. Everybody knows it, and you know, I can see the obvious include here with the Snowland Synergy. Because if you, correct me if I'm wrong, if you remove a snow land, Extra Planet Lands only sees the snow version of that land. Uh, so it doesn't do the Correct. Vernal Bloom effect where it's every force, it's only the snow force. So I, I can see it's here. It, it's good, yes. Is it necessary? Uh, I don't think so. And since uh, Trent's only running 25 force, which will then be 24 after you exile the first one, you may not be getting as much benefit as it appears. I, mean, I, I could be wrong on that, just something I something I noticed. Uh, another card I wanted to point out was Emerald Medallion. It, it is a good card, you know, just like Extra Planner Lens, but uh, playing a deck that depends on, you know, creek creatures to get the W, uh, there are other options you can find with a similar effect, but in creature form. And uh, I, I know Trent mentioned that, you know, 33 creatures is the sweet spot. Currently, we're seeing 31, not including the commander. So if you're looking for a side grade, which might actually be a downgrade, uh, you could swap that with Nylea Keen-Eyed which kind of has the same thing, but for creatures, and it also lets you draw a card uh, if the top card of your library is a creature. I think generally speaking, if, I, I don't know what cards I would particularly do this with, but I, I do tend to agree, like, if you can convert a few of these things over to creatures, I, I think the deck, that doesn't hurt the deck. I think overall, it might even make it a little bit better. So talking about Ember Medallion being a, an effect you can replicate elsewhere on a body. You, you know, we mentioned that before with Sylvan Scrying. I do think it, it, the, this deck might be a little bit um, more efficient if you did replicate a handful of those effects over on creatures. So I'm kind of in agreement there as well. How about you, Max? Do you have any thoughts on it? You know, I, I mainly was looking at 
other ways to manipulate the top deck. So, you know, scrying is a great way to do that. So stuff like Crystal Ball, which you can pay one to tap to scry. Otherwise, there's also Life Crafters Bestiary, where you always get to scry at your upkeep. But then you can also pay a green when you cast a creature spell to draw a card. So it's a little more of an investment, three to cast, plus always having that extra mana available, which if the extra planar lens or the vernal bloom are still on the list, I think that's not going to be an issue if that card were to be in here. Uh, Lifecrafters BCR is a really good call here. Um, it's one of those cards that I, I, when it first came out, I was kind of uh, hyped on it, and I just tried to run it generically in decks, and it was okay, but it never felt like it worked as well as it should. I, I feel like if it's going to work anywhere really well, it's this kind of deck where the scry does have value in addition to just being a scry. Like, not that scry is ever bad, but in this kind of deck, it is a lot more valuable being able to manipulate that to put that creature on top. So no, that's that's a, that's actually I like that call a lot here. Yeah, I have run Bestiary before. It's in and out of the deck uh, just because you know I want to try out new cards, and that's unfortunately almost always on the chopping block. It's good, but sometimes it's just not good enough. It's whatever I'm feeling. But no, that is a uh, that is a solid recommendation. I do like that. It's one of those cards that like I remember when I first saw it, I'm like, oh, that's gonna be so good. It's just one green mana for the effect. But the amount of times that one green mana is is, is more than you want to spend because you're planning on doing things that turn and you're like, if I spend that one green, I can't do the other thing I want to do. I, I was surprised at how often that happened. Yeah, that is a thing that, that can trip up your uh, your sequence of plays. I have noticed that. Last but not least, the creature package. Dana, what do we have here? There are 31 total. So the creature, creature package here, we have Acidic Slime, as we talked about before, being a absolute bomb uh, on top of your library that everyone's probably scared of. Apex Altasaur, and I'll read that one here briefly. It's a 10-10 for 9 mana, and when it enters the battlefield, it fights up to one target creature you don't control. And whenever it is dealt damage, it fights up to one target creature you don't control. So it's probably going to fight two creatures when it comes into play in almost every situation. Brutalizer Exarch, uh, 6 mana. When it enters the battlefield, you can choose one. You can search your library for a creature card and put it on top of your library, or you can put target non-creature permanent on the bottom of its owner's library. Those are both useful things, and in this deck where you care about stuff on top, it is even more useful. Cavalier of Thorns, uh, Reach, and when it ETBs, put the top, look at the top five cards of your library and put a land card from among them on the battlefield and the rest into your graveyard. And when it dies, you can exile it and put another card from your graveyard on top of your library. So that's just a bunch of things this deck wants to do. Putting stuff in the graveyard, um, ramping, and putting cards from your graveyard on top of your library. It's all right there in one package. Of course, for Crufix, great value. Same with Dawn Treader Elk. Deceiver of Forms, we've talked about quite a bit already. That's kind of a win condition in this deck. Elger, excuse me, Elder Gargaroth, um, new card from them, 21. Vigilance, Reach, Trample, uh, First Strike, Lifelink, Double Strike, Flying. Uh, no, it only has a first three. <laughs> I was exaggerating. Um, Vigilant, Reach, and Trample. But it also, um, when it attacks or blocks, so for both of those things, you can choose one. You can create a 3-3 green, a three, three green beast. You can gain life or you can draw a card. Eternal Witness, obviously, a uh, super heavily played green card. That's a great one to recur here. Fauna Shaman, you can spend a green and tap it to discard a creature card and search your library for a creature card, reveal it and put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. Fierce Empath is a, a creature tutor on a stick. Uh, Garruk's Horde, um, another top of your library card. You play with it revealed, and you may cast the top card of your library if it's a creature card. Genesis is something that a creature that does things in your graveyard. At the beginning of your upkeep, if it is in your graveyard, you can spend two in a green and return it, or excuse me, return target creature card from a graveyard to your hand. God Eternal Ronus, uh, when it ETBs, you double the power of each other creature you control until end of turn. So that's kind of like a a budget crater hoof, basically, in this kind of deck. Mulvani Beast Tracker, um, when it ETBs, search your library for a creature card with Death Touch, Hexproof, uh, Reach, or Trample, and reveal it, and put that card on top of your library. Oracle Moldaya, uh, you know, some more top deck fun there. Pathbreaker Ibex, a um, budget crater hoof, although not really anymore. Once upon a time, <laughs> it was the budget crater hoof, but it's a... Closing in on $25. Protean Hulk, uh, no flash here, so it's just kind of a value piece, but there's a lot of sack outlets to get that value. Reclamation Sage, obviously a kind of staple in the format that lets you destroy an artifact or enchantment, and this is a good deck where you can recur it. Regal Behemoth, a monarch card here, and it's also a mana doubler on a, on a body. Runic Armasaur, whenever an opponent activates the ability of a creature or a land that isn't a mana ability, you may draw a card. Uh, Scourge Elder, obviously a really good ramp piece. 
uh, Skullwinder. Um, whenever it enters the battlefield, return target card from your graveyard to your hand, um, then an opponent does the same. Uh, so it's a basically a regrowth um, on a stick that hits you and somebody else. Uh, Spore Frog is a recurrable fog on a body. Thrashing Brontodon is another kind of um, Reclamation Sage kind of effect. Vigor prevents damage dealt to your creatures, and they get counters put on them for, for damage dealt. So just a good card to have in a deck that cares about kicking people in the face. Vizier of the Menagerie. Look at the top card of your library. You can cast it if it's a creature card, and you can spend mana though, or mana of any type to cast creature spells. So that kind of gives you a, a workaround for the uh, Deceiver of Forms. A uh, Whip Tongue Hydra, just a really good value body that has reach, and when an ETBs destroy all creatures with flying, there's not a lot of creatures Trash with card. flying here. So <laughs> yeah, Ma- Max, not a big fan of this against his Dramonka deck. A woodland bellower. Um, when it ETBs, you can search your library for a non-legendary green creature card with converted mana cost three or less, and put it onto the battlefield. World spine worm. Talked about a little bit before that when it dies, it makes a bunch of bodies. So there's a combo there with a deceiver of forms. And last but not least, let Yavamaya elder. Which when it dies, you can search your library for up to two basic land cards, put them in your hand, and if you do, shuffle your library. And you can also sack it to draw a card. So some pretty good value there if you happen to be recurring it. And it's a card that I also think looks a lot like the um, old school Marvel comic character Modok. I don't think it's supposed yeah. to be just a giant <laughs> floating head, but that's what it kind of always looks like to me. Like it. Okay, well, thank you, Dana. 31. I had a couple cards here. I had a couple creatures, and I was like, I feel like there should be a few of these in this deck, but actually they're, they're, the, the three I had picked out are all on either your list or Nick's list, Max. So I'm just going to <laughs> pass it off to you to, for your suggestions, then, then we'll see what Nick had, because you guys have me covered here. Okay, I have a few more to add to my list already, but when I was looking at the creature selection, I pretty much just went with stuff that I find fun because I think that's what <laughs> this deck wants to do is have a lot of fun. So my first one, of course, is Galta Primal Hunger. It's the big bad T-Rex that's cheaper for the total amount of power on your board to drop a 12-12. So that just seems really good, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Oh, and it has Trample underneath all that other text on it. <laughs> my other suggestions are Green Warden of Marasa. This is a mythic out of battle for Zendikar. It's four green green, and it's a five four. When it enters the battlefield, you may return target card from your graveyard to your hand, and when it dies, you may exile it and do the same thing. Just a great piece of recursion on a pretty decent body that, you know, you don't have to exile it. You could put it in your yard and who will to it back to your hand back to the top of your library and just repeat the process if you really wanted to. So those are my first two uh, suggestions. But my final suggestion, because I've never seen this creature played, is Majestic Miriark. This is a 5 mana Chimera, 4 and a green. Its power and toughness are equal to twice the number of creatures you control. And then it also has the Odric 2.0 text on it. So at the beginning of each combat, uh, Majestic Miriark gains flying until the end of turn if you control a creature with flying. Same is true for First Strike, Double Strike, Death Touch, Haste, Hexproof, Indestructible, Lifelink, Menace, Reach, Trample, and Vigilance. So if you have any of those keywords, this, this body gets it and can wreck face, I'm assuming. If you give it Trample and flying, probably, you might just win the game. That's pretty cool. I like that. What about you, Nick? All right, so I got I got quite a bit. <laughs> so, uh, one two cards I want to shout out here that are already in the list: Runic Armosaur. I'm not normally a fan of this because I don't like cards that you know you, that need your opponents to do things for you to gain benefit. However, after you know rereading the uh, the intro, going back to that Aristocrats player, for every time you do like a Viserysir activation, you draw a card, which just seems really good. It's almost too good not to include, so keep that in there. I like that choice. Uh, the other one was Garrick's Horde. Uh, so being able to play creatures off the top is kind of what this deck wants to do. Casting them for a reduced cost or getting them for free off of Lurking Predators is super cool. But paying full price for them and being tied to a 7-mana creature without protection, not as cool. Um, I, I had it in the first um, in my first draft of the deck, but it just kind of fell short uh, in practice just because it costs so much. Uh, so something I would consider there. As far as possible additions, uh, I noticed Trent has Conduit of Ruin in the, uh, in the maybe board. I'll read that here. Uh, it's a 6-mana Eldrazi 5-5. Five, five. When you cast Conduit of Ruin, you may search your library for a colorless card, creature card with CMC 7 or greater, reveal it, shuffle your library, and then put that card on top of it. And it also has the first creature spell you cast each turn cost 2 less. 
So I it looks like uh, Trent's not a not the biggest fan of Ultrazi, uh, but I would consider putting this back into the deck just because of how ridiculously hard it is to do Deceiver of Form. Because you, you need to do a few things, right? One, you got to find Deceiver of Form. Two, you have to set up the top of your deck with a killer creature before combat, and three, you need to have a lot of creatures to get any value out of it whatsoever. So I would consider you know putting that into the deck as well as a couple more Eldrazi. Some suggestions, World Breaker, it's 6 and a green for a 5-7. It has to void, so you can search it out with Conduit of Ruin. When you cast it, it's it's pretty much a super acidic slime. You can exile an artifact, enchantment, or land. It has reach, and you can recur it for 2, a colorless, and sacrificing a land. Artisan of Kozilek is a 9-mana 10-9 with Annihilator 2. When you cast Artisan of Kozilek, you can return a creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Nice thing with that is, if you reveal that off of Deceiver of Form, everything just becomes a 10-9 Annihilator 2, <laughs> so they end the game in quick fashion. <laughs> Gross. Last one I want to recommend here is, I know Crater Hoof's in the sideboard, but there's another smaller version of Crater Hoof that you might be able to use. Decimator of the Provinces. It's a 10-mana 7-7. Seven, seven with Trample and Haste. When you cast Decimator of the Provinces, creatures you control get plus two, plus two, and gain Trample till end of turn. So it's a small overrun effect, but it also has Emerge for six and triple green, so you can kind of cheat the cost on there, and sometimes sacrificing creatures to get something into your graveyard to then put it back on top is something you want to do, especially when you're setting up Deceiver of Form. Uh, so adding like a small package like that, you might find some use out of that. Let's see, speaking of Deceiver of Form, Elder Gargaroth is like super sweet tech in here. I think I'm going to pick one up after <laughs> after we're done here. And one of the other issues that Trent mentioned is finding a balance between top deck enablers and top deck payoffs. Uh, I found, you know, I ran into this issue as well. And the resolution for me was to just add creature versions, uh, as many creature versions of those types of effects as I could. Dana, you had mentioned uh, Call of the Wild earlier in the episode. I also want to recommend Zoologist, which is the creature version. It's three and a green for a one-two human druid. You can pay three green and tap it uh, to reveal the top card of your library. If it's a creature, put it into play. If it's not, put it into the graveyard. So it's a one-shot effect, but it does the same thing, and it's a creature. Two other creatures that, you know, can use the top card of your library. Uh, Thicket Elemental and Auspicious Sterix. Uh, so Thicket Elemental is a 4-4 four, four for three and double green. It has Kicker. When it comes into play, if you pay the kicker cost, reveal the top card of your library. If it's a creature, put it into play. Pretty easy. Auspicious Sterics from Ikoria. It is a 6-6 six, six for 4 and a green, but it has Mutate 5 and a green. When a creature mutates, you exile the top card of your library until you hit a permanent card, and you can just put it into play. So, pretty uh, pretty nice to hit things off of that. It also it also trigger all of your Garrick's Horde, or not Garrick's Horde, um, Garrick's Uprising, and you know, the Great Hange and Guardian Project, and all that stuff that cares about creatures. So I know you're not looking to upgrade it anymore, but if you're looking to smooth things out of it, that's one way of doing it. And then the last recommendation is just a just a little neat trick that I learned not too long ago with Huatuo, adding Moldgraf Monstrosity to the deck. So Moldgraf Monstrosity, uh, it is a uh, three triple green and four for an 8-8 Insect with Trample, uh, Moldgraf Monstrosity says when it dies, exile it, and then remove, or then return two creature cards at random from your graveyard to the battlefield. So the trick with this one is, if it, if you can sacrifice it, you can put its trigger on the stack, and then use Hua 202 to put it back on top of your library so it will never be exiled, but you'll still get the two creatures back, which is super sweet. <laughs> nice. That's, that's interesting. That's super cool. Yeah, sorry for the big rant there, but uh, but yeah, I like this deck. <laughs> I got a lot to talk about. Hey, <laughs> no, that's that's that, good. That's why we brought you on because we figured yeah, you'd have a lot, lot to with, say. It helps a lot with understanding how the whole thing plays. Yeah, the, the zookeeper kind of cards were the ones that really jumped out at me as I thought would be really useful here. So once I saw you had those in the list, I'm like, oh, I'll let him talk about them since you probably know even more about how they actually work than me just just hoping they worked right. So all right, uh, Nick, thanks a lot, um, Trent. Thanks a lot for supporting the show. We really do appreciate it. And Max, thanks a lot for doing all the work this week. I got kind of busy. Um, so not only did, did Max and Chris record without me a week or so ago, but Max did all the work for this one. So thanks a lot, bud. I do appreciate that. Hey, no problem. We're a team. Happy to help. Uh, Nick, why don't you remind everyone here where they can find you before we sign off? Yeah, so uh, first, Trent, call me. We should swap tech. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can find me I'm mostly on Twitter at platclad. 
And uh, you can also find me uh, at Scrap Trawlers. Uh, again, we do budget-focused EDH content. We stream games every other Sunday on Twitch, twitch.tv at Scrap Trawlers. We also do discussion streams every other Tuesday at the same place. So uh, come check us out. Come say hi. We absolutely will definitely come say hi to you there again, and we'll be playing you here in the near future. So we will post that if anyone wants to come watch. Um, we'll be joining Scrap Trawlers here to play our budget decks here at some point, I think, around the end of the month. I think, was that right, Nick? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so once we have an exact date, we'll, we'll let everyone know so you can come uh, watch them and us at the same time. You can find the whole podcast at CMDR Central on the Twitter birds. You can find me at Dana Roach. You can find Max at CMDR Central underscore Max. And you can find Chris at Wise Squishy One. Our podcast theme is Retro Future Dirty by Kevin McLeod, licensed via Creative Commons. And our podcast is edited by Rafael Garcia. And you can find the Bear Man on Twitter at Ursa Bear Walker. Until next week, I'm Dana. I'm Max. And I'm Nick. We'll